Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his top 25 most anticipated games for 2018. And Happy New Year, everybody, in case I'm the first person to say it. I'm sure I'm not, but still, Happy New Year to you and yours. It looks like 2018 is going to be very exciting, at least in the realm of games. And I know that because I spent the last couple days making this geek list on Board Game Geek, which you can find a link for down in the show notes. This is the geek list I will be updating throughout the year. Every time I hear about a new game that I am very, very stoked for, I will put it on here and tell you why. So feel free to subscribe to it and uh, you can follow along. Now, as of today, January 1st, there are 102 items on this list if I recall correctly. And that's a lot. I'm not going to talk about all of those. I'm just going to talk about my 25 most anticipated. They are what are here on the first page. I've got them sorted uh, down at the bottom. Number 25 is my least of the most anticipated. And up at the top of the list is number one. I'm going to walk you through them. And if you want to know about the rest, like I said, you can just come check out the the uh, page yourself, or you can go listen to the next episode of my podcast, which I'll be putting up in the next day or two or so, where I talk about the other four pages of games that are on this list. So you can look for that at podcast.rado.com in the very, very near future. But for now, let's start counting down what we should be really stoked for. Although, man, it, it's, it's funky to do this right now because you know, even though I've got 102 titles here, I would bet you money that if you fast forward to a year from now, my top 10 games of 2018, probably seven of them won't be on this list because they haven't even been announced yet. I mean, it's still early days, but in spite of that, there's so much cool, exciting stuff coming. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of just a smidge of it right now. Let's go on ahead and hit the in key, jump down to the bottom of the list, and start scrolling up. Are you ready, folks? And here we go. Let's talk about number 25, Quad Heroes, which is a funky little game. I so like the look of this. And I have to admit, I mean, this actually was at, you could demo it at Essen Spiel a few months ago. And I kind of regret not having checked it out because the thing is, when this game was originally announced, um, it was, they mostly focused on the fact that it's a race game and it's a player versus player duel game. You know, there's lots of players punching. And so I kind of dismissed it out of hand. But more recently, I discovered it actually includes rules for cooperative play as well. Why didn't they lead with that? I would have been all over this game because um, what it's all about is each player gets their own little quad hero, which is like a, you know, a, a cube miniature, and they look gorgeous. They're really, really neat looking. And they kind of stomp around the board by rotating like dice. You know, they uh, rotate 90 degrees and fall forward and then, you know, uh, fall to the right and fall forward. They just kind of keep tumbling around. And the gameplay comes from the fact that every time they tumble forward, I believe whatever the top face of them is, that means there's a specific action devoted to that. So not only are you limited to how you move around by these dice that just kind of keep tumbling around, but you have to think strategically about what actions you want to par uh, you know, do based on what face you're going to have exposed as your little die mini, your quad hero, rumbles around the board. I think that's so cool and it looks gorgeous. And since there's cooperative play, I'm very, very interested in this now. now I do worry a little bit because, hey, is, is the cooperative play going to be one of those, oh yeah, we threw that in as an afterthought sort of thing, or is it really going to be an excellent uh, cooperative experience? I don't know, but I'm intrigued enough to put it at number 25 on the list, Quad Heroes. And now let's move on to number 24, and we've got Anduin, the first city of the West, which actually was on my most anticipated games last year. Didn't quite make it. I believe it's going to come out this year. And what I said last year still stands. Jen and I love City Council, although it seems like it's a bit of a Marmite game. People either love it or hate it. Jen and I love it. It's a semi-cooperative game where players are all members of a City Council trying to make proposals for what the city should spend its resources on and with new buildings and all of that. And uh, you know, we thought the semi-cooperative nature was great, the negotiation that goes on, the secret objectives and all that, but some people didn't like it at all. Well... There's now a sequel to it, which is not set in a modern real-world city, but a high fantasy city where we're all still members of the city council trying to decide how the city is going to advance and evolve. But it is now completely cooperative. The semi-co-op nature has come out completely. 
So, I love city council, I love cooperative games, I love city building games, I love fantasy games. Hey, that's four things I love, so I expect I'm very much going to enjoy this game. Kind of sad for the uh, semi-co-op being gone, but I understand a lot of people didn't like it, so it's probably a smart move to really redouble their efforts focusing on the cooperative nature in Anduin, first city of the West, number 24. Now, number 23 is going to be Sorcerer City. <clears throat> this is from designer Scott Caputo. And I've played one of his games before, Whistlestop. It came out last year from Bezier Games, and it was probably one of the best games of the year. Whistlestop is absolutely brilliant. I was, you know, gobsmacked just how smart it was, how fun and fast and compulsive, and it just, it just really, really rock solid design. Um, hi, Honey Pie, you're on camera. And. Uh, Happy New Year! Jim says Happy New Year in case you couldn't hear it with the mic. But anyway, so um, Scott's follow-up game is Sorcerer City. I don't know much about it. I'm mostly just going on the fact that Whistle Stop itself was so phenomenal. But I do like the idea. Hey, it's another fantasy game. I think actually my, the first six games, give or take, on this list are going to be high fantasy. Warning for folks who don't like high fantasy, but hooray for us who love it. Anyway, so it's a fantasy city. And uh, my understanding is the main thing is we're a bunch of mages who can use magic to shift the city around to different configurations. I don't know, kind of like um, the, uh, oh, well, you know, what's that staircase in, in Hogwarts, in Harry Potter? You know, the, the whole thing is just constantly changing and shifting around us. So I'm interested in that. And more importantly, I'm interested in the fact that Scott Caputo's previous game, Whistle Stop, was absolutely brilliant. So I'm expecting good things from Sorcerer City. I just don't know enough about it for it to rank higher. So that's why it's at number 23. Then on to number 22. No Dawn. Okay, this is going to be one of the games coming out this year from a new publisher, Colossal Games, uh, which was started by... Travis Chance, uh, formerly of Action Phase Games, and um, you know Travis and his uh, design development partner Nick, those guys really know what they're doing. I mean, I have always been impressed by every game that they have ever been involved with. And so now Travis is out on his own. One of his new big games is going to be No Dawn. It's a cooperative fantasy worker placement deck builder hybrid. I like worker placement. I love deck building. Did I mention I really like Cooperative and Fantasy? This is another thing I'm very, very excited about. And um, while Travis is not the designer of it, the fact that he is overseeing it and he's a really sharp guy, I'm very, very stoked for this. Although uh, I mentioned Travis and Nick, I'm also uh, very excited for something that Nick is putting out this year, although it's a little bit higher on the list. But still, I wish I knew more about this game. I know nothing other than Travis is involved, and he's a very smart developer. He's a really sharp cookie, and uh, this ticks all the boxes for me. So, No Dawn hits in at number 22. Then, moving on to number 21. Oh, there's a big old picture here. Got to scroll up a bit higher. There is Grim Heroes. Now... This game, it's interesting, this picture, I put it in here, because this picture was from the game back in 2011. This has been on the slow burn for years now. Uh, since, you know, for, gosh, almost a decade, they've been working on it. And in the meantime, the gameplay elements of this, this is a uh, Yahtzee-style dice-chucking game. It is a competitive game, but a, again, a high fantasy game. Although kind of a dark fantasy, the art style um, is really, really sharp, which you can tell from that picture. But in the time it's taken to, for this game to come out, uh, the designer artist has in the meantime put out Ancient Terrible Things, which Jen and I absolutely love that game. And we love the expansion for it. And um, so, you know, back when I got Ancient Terrible Thing years ago, back in, what, in 2014, I think, there was an ad, a teaser for Grim Heroes in the box. And so I've been waiting for this game forever. Hopefully, this is the year it finally comes out. I don't know much about it other than the fact that I guess it still borrows the same sort of Yahtzee-style dice-rolling core mechanism, which was so brilliant in Ancient Terrible Things. You can watch my run-through of it to see how much, how cool it was, how Jen and I really, to this day, still love that game. So, even though I think it was developed before, it's now the spiritual sequel to Ancient Terrible Things, Grim Heroes. Very, very excited about it coming in at number 21.
Then on to number 20, uh, Treasure Island. Now, uh, this is from one of the co-designers, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, of uh, Yamatai, which was a very, very sharp game that came out last year. And, you know, Jen and I liked it a lot, except for the way it implemented two-player gaming, which I think really came from the co-designer, Bruno Catala uh, Yamatai, who is not involved with this. His co-designer, oh man, I really should have written down the names of all these designers. I feel bad. Let's go back. Grim Heroes, designed by and Treasure Island designed by and let's see since I'm trying to be thorough No Dawn designed by No, Desi no Dawn designed by come on internet oh my internet is so slow here in Malta there we go uh, JB Howell and Grim Heroes from um, Simon McGregor with art by Rob Van Zyl. I think uh, Rob's also involved in the design of it. But again, these guys are fantastic working together. And now, uh, Treasure Island from uh, Mark uh, Paquin, the other co-designer of, um, oh, what do you call it? I've already lost track. Oh, I'm so scatterbrained. Yamatai. So anyway, Yamatai was great. Didn't like the two-player rules. I suspect those came from Bruna. My guess is Mark probably was the uh, you know the instigator of this game, and Yamatai was a brilliantly designed game. Just a few things we didn't like. So I like his pedigree. I want to see where he goes next. And next up for him is Treasure Island. I'll be honest though. The main reason this is on the list and it comes in at number twenty isn't the designer. It is the artist. Vincent Dutre is. I, you know, at this point, that's just, let's just call it. He is the, the number one artist working in board games today. Everything he puts his pen to just looks so gorgeous. I, I raved about him last year on Museum. I'm sure Treasure Island is going to be stunningly gorgeous too. And so, I'm excited for the gameplay, whatever it lays and hold. Although, actually, I'm a little bit worried because uh, there's not much of a description here yet, but it says it has a lot to do with players being able to bluff against each other. I love that. Jen often doesn't, so that might be an issue for us. But but whether the game works well or not, it's going to be gorgeous. So, Treasure Island comes in at number 20. Then, on to number 19, Black Angel. Okay, this is from Pearl Games. Uh, the gang is all together. The, um, you know, the people behind Twa and Carson City and Deus. I mean, these are some of the best designers working in the industry today. And when they get together, they make some beautiful, beautiful games. Again, Twa, um, you know, which is really their their biggest communal hit. Uh, you know, Dujardin and George and Orban, uh, all working. You know, Pearl Games. These guys made something you know that's transcended. Twa is still in my top ten games of all time. I can't imagine anything knocking out. It's so brilliant. And so finally, they're all back together again. And, and this year, they'll be bringing us Black Angel. That's all I know. But that is enough for me to put this in at number 19. Now, I'm a little bit nervous about this because this is a big epic space exploration game. And um, I've had some mixed results with that over the last few years. I was really excited about Solarius missions and Kepler 3042. And while they were gorgeous, brilliant designs, they just didn't work for me in Gen because we found we don't really enjoy the vast reaches of space as much as we previously thought. But Last year's Pulsar 2849 did crack my top 10, and that was a space exploration game too. So it proved that, you know, um, Jen and I can overcome our distaste for traveling from planet to planet to planet. It looks like from the only screenshot exists of this game, there's going to be more of that here. So I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm infinitely confident, epically confident, because this design team, they can't fail. They, um, it's going to be amazing. And so, it's number 19, Black Angel. Cannot wait for this one. But there's stuff I'm even more excited about. So let's go to 18, Carnival of Monsters. Uh, from designer Richard Garfield, you know, the creator of Magic the Gathering and Robo Rally and all of that. And, um, you know, the, the, I'll be honest, the reason this is on the list, I've, I've seen some art for it, it looks like it's going to be really gorgeous. It's a card drafting game where we are trying to capture monsters to put in our carnival, which I have to admit is not a particular turn on in terms of theme, you know, capturing and displaying animals. Uh, I'm a little bit on the fence about that, but hey, you know what, Dungeon Pets is one of my favorite games of all time, so uh, it'll probably be okay. But the reason this is on the list is probably the silliest one. I've, I've paid almost no attention to the gameplay at all, but Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower, Mr. Dice Tower himself, has been raving about this game, it seems like, for years now. He is super duper excited about it, uh, so much so that he broke his own rules and did a preview video for this when it was on uh, Kickstarter last year, I think, if I recall correctly. That's how I first heard about it. I'm like, wow. 
Okay, well, this is something I have to check out. For Tom to rave about this so much that he wants to put his name on it, or the, the Dice Tower name on it, it's probably really, really cool. I mean, hey, Richard Garfield is a brilliant designer. Just because I don't like uh, King of Tokyo and I've long outgrown magic doesn't mean I don't appreciate how smart this guy is. So I expect Carnival of Monsters is going to be really interesting. But mostly, I'm just curious to see if it lives up to Tom's high expectations. So that's number 18, Carnival of Monsters. Then on to number 17, Century Eastern Wonders. Now, this is very, very interesting. This is the sequel to Century Spice Road, which I did a run through for last year, and you may recall. Jen, I thought it was a good game, but it just wasn't really for us. It was a little on the light side, and the two player didn't work as well as we would have hoped. So we kind of, ah, you know, I was almost ready to get, I mean, I thought, okay, this is a great game, just not for us, needs higher player counts, um, you know, a bit too gateway ish. But I kept it because I knew that it was getting a sequel. And here's the first announcement of it, uh, Century Eastern Wonders. Now, the interesting thing about this is Eastern Wonders, I guess it's, uh, well, you know, I, I don't know much about it, but it's actually got a board. It's not just an abstracted card game like its prequel is. And you're moving around. I don't know if it has area control. I haven't really paid much attention to it. The reason I'm excited about this is because Eastern Wonders is a unique style of game with a board and moving pieces around. Um, the previous run, Spice Road, is a unique type of game. It is a card drafting goods conversion game. Totally different styles of games set in the same um, time frame. And the thing is, if you have both of these games, you can meld them into one bigger game. And, I mean, even though they're radically different styles of gameplay, they come together, they can stand on their own, or they can form a bigger thing. I'm super duper stoked about it. I want so much to see how that works out, because I'm very intrigued by that as a design challenge. Do, I mean, because, again, Spice Road stands on its own. It's a rock-solid little game. Heck, for a lot of people, it was one of the 10 best of the year. It wasn't for me and Jen, because of the shortcomings we have for two-player, and it was a little bit too light. But hey, when you add Eastern Wonders, what changes? How does it evolve? How do these things stand on their own, and how do they come together? I'm very excited to find out. This is really cool stuff. And it's why it makes my list number 17, Century Eastern Wonders. Then on to number 16, Kung Fu Panda the Board Game. Now, actually, I got to play a demo of this at Essen Spiel last year. And it is a real-time cooperative dice rolling adventure game. Um, very much kind of in the same mold as in a Escape, Curse of the Temple. You've got this maze you're going through and you're rolling dice as fast as you can to try to get the right faces. If you get the wrong faces, your teammates can help you out so that you don't get stuck. And it's all set in the cute, charming, Jack Black, DreamWorks, the Kung Fu Panda universe. And you know, Jedi, we enjoy those movies. I mean, they're not the greatest things in the world, but we, we've enjoyed them. I mean, it's, it's hard not to be charmed by these cute, anthropomorphized um, uh, martial arts animals. But, so here's the thing. I got to play it, and I thought, wow, this is really solid. Um, you know, this feels very, um, you know, Escape, Curse of the Temple, which is, I love. It's in my top 20 games of all time. And, um, yeah, this really captures the feeling and does some cool, new, interesting stuff. And the guy who was demoing for us said, yeah, that's because um, Christian, the, or Osby, the designer of Escape, Curse of the Temple, is one of the co-designers on this, or he's a contributing designer. So, this is kind of an unofficial sequel to Escape, Curse of the Temple. That's really, really cool. Now, I'm actually going to be doing a run-through for this when it goes on Kickstarter, so I won't spend too much time talking about it now. I do actually have a, 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 a prototype copy of it. The minis for this are absolutely gorgeous. Really great-looking stuff. It's from the same publisher that did... Um, uh, Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds are Go, uh, which ha ultimately had really, really cool miniatures as well, the way they did all the Thunderbird ships. So I expect the final production for this is going to be great. I know the gameplay is going to be great because I've already played it. Um, so on the list, it had to go at number 16, Kung Fu Panda, the board game. And then number 15, Artificial Intelligence. Um, um, from Nuno Bizarro and uh, Paolo Soledad, these guys, a few years ago, I think it was 2014, uh, put out through publisher What's Your Game, Madeira, which is an amazingly bonkers, brilliant design. Absolutely loved it to death. Although, man, it was crazy heavy. It was probably a little bit too heavy for me and Jen at the end of the day. No matter how much we loved it, and we, I mean, so it was absolutely brilliant, uh, it really cemented these guys as designers to watch. And so, it's been a few years. We've been waiting for Brazil for a while. It should be coming out. I've talked about that in the past. Um, but what's even more exciting uh, than Brazil finally coming out, you know, which is kind of the spiritual follow-up to Madeira, I'm more excited about their next game, AI. Because 
It's so far removed from what they do, from what's your, what, what's your game, the publisher does. It is set in um, you know, our mankind's near future as the, uh, you know, the singularity, you know, the, the, the true breakthrough of AI happens, and you know, we're companies actually trying to benefit from this. I expect greatness in terms of the design, and I am very excited about the setting. And, uh, and I can't wait to see how the theme and the gameplay merge into one. It's coming from What's Your Game, my favorite board game publisher in the world. Uh, so I know it'll play smooth, it'll be really solid. Uh, it's my number 15, Artificial Intelligence. And now, moving on to number 14, we have got Crisis at Steamfall. So, this is, oh man, why don't I remember everybody's names? So many game designer names. I, I'll give credit cards to Let's look up the designer of Assault on Doom Rock, Tom um, Stasiak, who you know, made such an amazingly brilliant game. Assault on Doom Rock is so sharp. I have raved about it at great length in my original run-through when I covered the uh, expansion for it. It's made a few of my top tens of all time. Uh, Assault on Doom Rock is amazing. And Crisis at Steamfall is Tom's second game. Uh, it's, he's been working on it for years, ever since uh, Doom Rock came out, and I'm very excited about it. It's a, it's a steampunk game, and I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous about it because it's an area control, everybody trying to exert dominance in this uh, city called Steamfall, and while I expected the gameplay is going to be really sharp and really kind of um, disrupting, you know, or you know, a really disruptive design in that it, it really turns normal Euro tropes on their head, the same way that Assault on Doom Rock did for standard adventure style cooperative games. I expect Crisis of Steamfall will do the same for Euro style area control. I'm a little nervous though because Jen and I were not the biggest fans of area control. We don't want to keep stealing land from each other. But I was talking to Tom about it at uh, Essen Spiel. I'm like, oh, I so want to get this game, but I'm worried it's going to be too mean for us. And he said, well, then you'll just play cooperative. I'm like, ah! He's working on cooperative. He has not abandoned it. And so, considering how amazing the uh, cooperative experience of Assault on Doom Rock was, I have very, very high hopes for my number 14, Crisis at Steamfall. Then, on to number 13. Oh, so sweet, so charming, Stuffed Fables. Now, this was actually supposed to be a 2017 game, but I believe it just missed it. Uh, they were hoping it was going to come out um, you know, in time for Christmas and then in the last week, but it hasn't quite made it, so it's been pushed now as far as I'm concerned, even though I know a lot of reviewers got a copy. As my day, why don't you send me a copy? Well, whatever. I'll, I, hopefully, I'll get to play this someday um, because I'm very, very intrigued by it. It's, uh, at, hence, it's at number 13. This is the follow-up to Mice and Mystics, which was an absolutely brilliant, charming, cooperative fairy tale adventure, uh, which Jen and I liked on a lot of levels. The presentation, the narration, the, the storytelling, the uh, a lot of the cool gameplay mechanisms. But for us, it was really held back by way too much focus on rolling dice. Uh, you had to roll dice so much in that game that Jen and I, we just couldn't keep going as much as we loved so much about the game. So Stuff Fables is, uh, you know, uh, uh, is a follow-up to that and um, is set in a new universe and it still has a lot of dice rolling, but from what I understand, the dice rolling is much less about, all right, okay, let's see to roll how much damage I do. Now let's see how I roll how much damage he does. Now let's roll for damage, 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 damage. You know, so much endless dice rolling. I think the focus in this game is less on that and more on, okay, let's pull dice out of a bag. So, um, you know, there's a random element and these dice we pull out de define what types of actions we can do. Not necessarily how well we do them, but what we do with the dice. That is what gets me excited about the use of dice in adventure games. So, I'm definitely down for Stuffed Fables, particularly because it looks so sweet and adorable and charming. Uh, it's a bunch of, um, you know, stuffed teddy bears and whatnot that go on an adventure into the nightmare dreamscape of the little girl who owns them because they're trying to make sure she has good dreams. Um, again, whimsical, sweet, charming, gorgeous minis, beautiful art, and now, hopefully, gameplay that lives up to um, you know, the potential. Fingers crossed, I'm very excited for number 13, Stuffed Fables. And then, number 12, a nice cup of tea. Now, um, if you watch my top 10 worker placement games of all time, I... Snowdonia from designer Tony Boydell uh, made it as one of the best worker placement games I've ever played. 
a nice cup of tea is a sequel to that. Not set in the um, the Welsh Highlands as you're trying to build a railroad, um, you know, over mountains, but instead it's set in uh, the uh, 19th century India. Still doing a lot of the same type of stuff, trying to build up rail lines and you know invest in infrastructure and all that, but in an entirely new environment with new resources. Most importantly being T, uh, which I know is instantly going to draw, I mean, Jen's attention because, hey, every time we play pretty much any game, she's sitting here with a big, gigantic mug of tea. So, uh, Snowdonia was brilliant. I can't wait to see what Tony has done to the core formula um, and, you know, what new he's brought in. Very, very excited at number 12, uh, or for number 12, a nice cup of tea. But now let's move on to number 11, CO2 second chance. Now, it's amazing. There are actually a lot of reprints and 2.0 revisions of games that are coming out. Go listen to my podcast because it's on the second or the third page that I list a whole bunch of other games that are getting revamps that are coming out in 2018. But of all of them, this is the one I'm most excited about. It actually pushed its way because, you know, I played CO2 a lot. I, I, I have to admit, I get a little bit less excited about, hey, let's revamp a game that I've already played because I already like the game. Sure, I'm interested. I want to see what you do new, but it's hard for one of those when I already know the game so well to push its way in. But CO2 does, because CO2 itself is brilliant. And um, Vito Lasarda has now revisited it. He's revamping it. He's taken it from being a semi-cooperative game, which the original game was, which Jen I absolutely loved, and he's made it fully cooperative. So heck, just like uh, City Council turning it into Anduin, for a lot of people, that's going to be really great news. But the brilliant thing is the board is two-sided, and for folks like me and Jen who love the semi-co-op nature, you can flip it over and still play semi-co-op instead of fully co-op. Although I look forward to trying it as a fully cooperative game as well. And one of the things I'm really excited about this, I actually talked to Vital about it uh, last year when I met him at a convention, is that... One of the reasons he wanted to revisit this is because the, um, you know, the game, a lot of the evolutions he's made to the design of the game are reflective of the evolution of our real life situation. Um, you know, as global warming, as climate change continues to become a bigger, more pressing uh, problem that is, you know, you know, really threatening to ruin the planet. And if you don't worry about that, it's threatening to cost humanity untold hundreds of trillions of dollars in damage and death and destruction, you know, because we just keep turning a blind eye. Well, actually, I shouldn't say we. We, Americans, turn a blind eye while the rest of the world acknowledges how much of a problem it is. But anyway, in spite of that, and, and in spite of the, you know, the Paris Agreements and whatnot, uh, you know, it's still becoming a problem, uh, getting worse and worse, day on day, uh, year in, year out. And so, Vital wanted to revisit this and rejigger the gameplay so it reflects where we are today. Um, so, you know, the, the stats have changed, the stakes have changed, um, the core gameplay is still the same of, you know, issuing CEPs to let you build green power plants and tear down the old ones and whatnot, but the stakes are higher than they've ever been because they are in real life too. I absolutely love that, that this is an environmentally conscious game. This isn't just, hey, I just had some new ideas for the gameplay. He has a reason um, to, uh, to bring this back out, and it's an important reason. It's, it's probably the single most important reason there is facing mankind today, uh, you know, the dangers. And so I'm excited to see this back, and heck, I'm excited to play a new version of it as well. CO2, second chance. Didn't quite make it, but now let's move on to the top 10. The, the, the big ones, starting with number 10, Legend Dice, which is also from publisher What's Your Game. And it's interesting. Uh, What's Your Game is predominantly known for really big, heavy, meaty Euros. And I expect we're going to be seeing them, like uh, Brazil and probably artificial intelligence. But um, What's Your Game a few years ago put out a, a lighter, more midweight Euro called Oddville. And I, Jen, I absolutely adored it. And I, I love it. I've said at the time uh, that I would love to see What's Your Game get more into the midweight as opposed to always just doing really big, heavy, complex games or, you know, heavier games. 
And last year, they brought out Loot Island, which is another, uh, it's like the second game in this uh, series they're doing now of smaller, slightly lighter games. Now, I don't know if Legend Dice is going to be the third in this series, but I'm betting it is because it's from the designer of Oddville and Johari. These are both brilliant, wonderful games that are really, really big experiences that fit in a super tiny portable package. Not only just in terms of the packaging, but the design of the game is really tight and and focused, but the gameplay itself is big and expansive. Johari, I think, made my top 10 big games in small boxes. And Oddville, I don't know if that made the list, but I certainly considered it. So anyway, the pedigree behind this game is splendid. Uh, uh, oh man, I, I know. I remember his name is Carlo once again. Why didn't I write down everybody's na designer names? I, I should be. I was a designer myself. I should do it. Uh, yeah, Carlo uh, uh, Le Levisi. Carlo Levisi's Oddville and Johari are both brilliant designs. What's Your Game is, for my taste, probably the best game publisher working today. They've all come together and they're giving us Legend Dice, which is a dice chunking uh, monster hunting game. Uh, so, I expect... It, you know, kind of a cool high fantasy thing, but not light gameplay, but nice solid medium 8 gameplay. I think it's going to be amazing. That's all I know. I know almost nothing about this because, heck, we're not going to find out about it till October for Essen Spiel. But I'm still very, very excited. That's why it makes number 10. Legend Dice. Then on to number 9, Edge of Darkness. Now, I have been super... Jen and I, we have loved Mystic Veil, vale, and I've been raving about it ever since it came out. Um, you know, every expansion that's come out for it so far has made it better and better. And um, the core gameplay element of crafting cards. You know, all the cards come in this... Uh, they, they come in sleeves, and as you, you buy additional powers for those cards, you slip into the sleeves and you modify and adjust cards over time. I think that's brilliant. Uh, last year, the uh, publisher, AEG, and designer... Oh man, I am so embarrassed I did not write down everybody's names. I'm going to stop repeating myself now. You know I'm embarrassed. Yeah, John Clare. Sorry, John. John D. Clare uh, made something really brilliant with... Uh, Mystic Veil. Last year they came out with like the second game that uses this system called Custom Heroes. I wasn't really interested because it was kind of a player dueling trick taking game, not really our cup of tea, but I'm very excited about the third game using this system from John and AEG, Edge of Darkness. This is a fantasy city building game. Hey, we're back into heavy fantasy folks, which I love. Um, and again, we're crafting cards, making them stronger, better, you know, putting new elements to it. But the interesting thing is, Everybody shares the same deck of cards that we're building up in this game, which I believe is true for Custom Heroes as well. And I don't know how this works, but the cards, as we build them up, they all have a light side and a dark side, side that helps and a side that hurts the city. And apparently, as we level them up to make them more powerful to help us build the city, they also, on the flip side of the card, the dark side, they become more powerful to destroy the city. That's very, very cool. I like that idea a lot. I love Mystic Veil. Vale. Jen and I both love the gimmick of building cards over time, and I can't wait to see what they're doing new with it in Edge of Darkness. Then on to number eight, Dice Settlers. Uh, now this is from Dave Turchi, the designer of Anachrony and Days of Ire and Redacted and Kitchen Rush. Uh, Dave is really setting himself up to be a designer to watch because every game he's put out has had a really smart, brilliant design. And every game he has done has been a radically different experience. He is not resting on his laurels and giving us more of the same. Um, and his next game coming up is Dice Settlers. This is is a uh, civilization building game by rolling dice. It is a bag builder, but unlike Orleans where you're pulling shits out of the bag, or um, automobiles where you're pulling cubes out of the bag, in this game you're building up and pulling out of the bag a bunch of dice. That in and of itself is so cool and attractive as a gameplay concept, but then knowing that it's coming from Dave, who I've just been so impressed by the, just the raw scope and um, uh, variety of his designs, uh, and, and, the, and the, the sharpness, the smartness of his designs too. And then the art is from the Miko, who is one of my probably top three favorite artists, maybe tied for number one? Oh, I don't know. Everything about this game is coming up roses. I'm very, very excited about it. That's why it's number eight, Dice Settlers. Then, on to number seven, Detective, a modern crime board game. Now, um, this is from Portal Games. I don't remember who the designer is. 
Once again, I'm embarrassed. I will go ahead and look it up. Is it from Ignacy Trevcheck himself or somebody else? Ignacy and... Oh... Uh, Prezimsla Reimer. I'm sorry, uh, Prez, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Polish names are very hard for an American like me. But anyway, so, here's what's interesting about this game. This is another, oh, there's been a murder or a crime or a robbery. I don't know. I assume the game comes with a series of different crimes that players have to work cooperatively to solve. Um, you know, this has been such a popular genre over the last couple of years, and more and more crime, deductive, cooperative games have been coming out with all different types of ways to approach that um, uh, genre that was pretty much popularized back in the early 80s by Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Here's what this game does different to set itself apart. Um, you know, there's, of course, there's going to be the board, there's going to be cards, there's going to be, you know, whatever the physical components are, because this is a board game, but there is a strong digital element to this game as well, because um, when, you, when you start playing the game, you'll need to have your laptop or your smartphone with you, because part of your investigations will take you off the board and into cyberspace. Uh, the, uh, the developers are making an online crime database that you can reference, and so it helps you role play the, the, the role of a police officer so much more because, hey, not only are we going out and, um, you know, I, I'm assuming interrogating people and um, looking for clues to the scene of the crime, but we're actually doing research. We're going online, finding out what their um, arrest records are and, um, you know, and, and digging deeper into this database and trying to find connections there, um, you know, which is something that you pretty much see in any modern crime solving game. There's always those sequences. And what I'm hoping, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if the digital only limits itself to just this database that Portal Games has created or if it goes one step further and introduces ARG, alternate reality game type stuff, like, um, you know, to be able to solve these murders, we have to actually go beyond the database and start web surfing for information as well. And maybe information is hidden in other places on the internet also. I don't know. I don't know how far they take this, but I love the potential. I love the ambition. I love... Well, I just love digital elements integrating into analog board games so that the games can provide experiences that would be impossible any other way. I suspect Detective, a modern crime board game, is definitely going to deliver on that, and that's why it's number seven for me. But now let's move on to number six. Hey, what's this? A another! Um, oh, in fact, there it is, right there. Um, Chronicles of Crime, another cooperative, solve a series of crimes investigation style game. Like I just said uh, just a second ago, there's a whole bunch of them. They've been coming out, um, you know, a mile a minute. What does Chronicles do to set itself aside? This little thing, um, a... Well, what do you call them? Oh, virtual reality. Virtual reality glasses is what makes Chronicles of Crime unique. Because unlike uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, where if you decide, oh, I want to go to the murder scene or whatever, or, or the crime scene or whatever it might be, okay, well, I'll just read a whole bunch of text. And then we'll try to figure out, oh, hidden amongst all this text, what's the red herrings, what's the actual important information that will help us investigate? In this game, you uh, th this game doesn't tell, it shows. Because when you go out to investigate stuff, you put on the virtual reality glasses and you are physically transported to these places. You actually investigate them real, live, in person, and look around. You don't try to parse clues from a bunch of Byzantine texts. You actually try to find the clues at the crime scene itself. Very excited for this. This is going to be so cool. Uh, last year, uh, we got to experience this with um, uh, Escape Room, the game Virtual Reality. It was, it was a very, very neat approach to doing escape rooms where you are actually physically there, and it allowed um, the developers to create escape rooms that would be impossible to create in the real world. I can't wait to see what they do with Chronicles of Crime um, to, uh, you know, to take that same idea, not in an escape room, but instead in a cooperative murder mystery type situation. Very, very excited for this. Number six, Chronicles of Crime. But then, on to number five. Vita Lasarda is back, baby, uh, with Escape Plan. Now, this is a game that he's been working on forever. I first put this on my most anticipated list back in 2014. I've been waiting for this for a long, long time, and it's Vital doing something very, very different than what he's become known for. These heavy, rich, complex um, and very thematic business simulations, whether you're running a gallery or a vineyard or, um, or a country 
country or, you know, or, or, a, or an energy company. I mean, yeah, you're, always you're, you're running these big things. In escape plan, the scope has changed completely. Instead, you, players are a group of thieves who have just pulled off a daring bank heist, and now they've got to get out of the city as the dragnet just comes in tighter and tighter, and they've got to try and slip out um, and get away. But the interesting thing is, this is not a cooperative game. This is a competitive game. All of us are trying to escape on our own as we're being hunted by the police. This is so cool. I mean, Vital is such a brilliant designer when it comes to melding theme into his mechanisms. So, such a far out theme for him, such a cool, exciting, dramatic theme, um, melded with his always brilliant gameplay design. I. Cannot tell you how excited. I've been waiting for this game now for almost a half a decade. So hopefully this is the year that we finally get to hatch our escape plan. That's why it's number five. And then on to number four. Oh, why didn't I look up how to pronounce this? Uh, Teotihuacan, City of Gods. I don't know how to pronounce it. I can barely spell it. But here's the important thing. This is, a, for all intents and purposes, the sequel to Zulkin, the Mayan calendar. From Daniele... Oh, this, I think this is the last designer I have to look up. Um, the designer of Zulkin... Actually, Zulkin had a few uh, co-designers, but one of them was uh, Daniele Tassini. Tassini. He is now revisiting, you know, um, the, the uh, ancient Central American society that is, you know, lost to history as they're, you know, building up a city to the gods in this game. But where um, Zulk in the Mind Calendar was a worker placement game where the workers became more powerful over time because they literally rode around on these physical gears on the board, which was a wonderful, brilliant mechanism. Here, um, the, your workers become more physically powerful over time because they are dice and the dice level up. So, it's that same basic idea of, over time, your workers get better so they can do more and more things, but um, with a completely different gameplay mechanism. So, Zulkin is in Jen's top 10 of all time. I mean, even aside from the gimmick of the Gears, it's just such a brilliant worker placement game. So, I have high, high hopes for what I'm going to dub is basically Zulkin the Dice Game. Um, Zulkin the Mind Calendar of the Dice Game, because I can't pronounce the real title of it, but I'm very, very excited. Cannot wait to check it out. Number four, uh, Teokan City of Gods. I'm just going to call it City of Gods, I think, from now on. But now, let's move on to number three, Stygian Society. Um, from, oh, I want to say Kevin Wilson. Shoot, I lied. One more designer to look up. I think this is from designer Kevin Wilson, who I will be honest is, yep, I was right. I didn't have to look it up. And publisher Ape Games. So, um, here's the thing. A million years ago, uh, a game came out called Wallenstein, which was a kind of a player versus player warfare area control Euro style board game where conflict between players as they fought over the board was resolved not by rolling dice, but by instead taking the cubes that represented your army forces, dropping them in a tower where they bounced around and got stuck on baffles and whatnot, and depending on what cubes came out would determine the winners and losers of these battles. It was a brilliant thing. It was ahead of its time. It was re-implemented in a follow-up game called Show gun and I have to admit I will probably never play either of those games because Jen and I don't want to play warfare games where we're trying to uh, wage war against each other just not our cup of tea but many years later designer Stefan Feld my favorite game designer of all time brought out reused the uh, the cube tower in a totally new way in Amerigo, which is a brilliant, brilliant Euro style game where you were dropping cubes not to resolve combat, but to or, you know warfare, but instead to determine what actions you can do every round. And it was so sharp, so fun, and Jen and I absolutely loved the tower. And I understand why Wallenstein and Shogun is so loved too. That tower is just so tactilely pleasing. It's just fun to grab a whole bunch of cubes, drop them in. You know some of them are going to get stuck. They're going to dislodge other stuff that's already stuck in there. Other things are going to come out. It's just such a brilliant randomizing um, option. It's dice with memory. And I love it. So, we love Amerigo. We're probably never going to get to experience because we don't want to. Shogun or Wallenstein. And so we figure, oh, that's all we get to see. But Kevin Wilson and Abe Games, finally this year, are going to be doing something new with the Cube Tower. And it is a cooperative fantasy um, combat adventure where the tower is, is going back to its original use for combat, for combat resolution, but now it's cooperative combat against bad guy monsters and stuff. 
Color me excited. Color me beyond the possibilities of being able to articulate just how excited we are. We love Amerigo so much. We have played that game so many times. We have dropped so many cubes in that tower. I'm so excited to, um, to see a new use for the tower. I cannot wait for Stygian Society. But still, there's stuff I want even more. Like, say, my number two. Oh my gosh. Aeon's End Legacy. Now, Aeon's End is a brilliant cooperative fantasy adventure deck builder. Um, it is my number two uh, fantasy cooperative card game of all time. It's only eclipsed by Shadowrun. And, uh, you know, I, uh, Jen and I, we are over the moon. It's so sharp, it's so smart. And um, this year, it's getting a new expansion slash standalone. Last year, it got one in War Eternal. It's getting another one this year, um, which you know adds a whole bunch of new cards to the system that already exists, and you can buy it as a standalone, or you can get for, get those cards to add to the games you're already playing, like a good deck builder. But what's most interesting about this, the standalone elements that come in this new game are legacy inspired. And if you've been watching my videos for the last couple of years, you know how much Jen and I enjoy legacy gameplay. This is going to be the first legacy deck builder on the market. That is incredibly excited, exciting. And then the fact that it is a follow-up to one of the best deck builders on the market, period, is even more amazing and exciting. Now, I don't know what the legacy elements take. We do know a little bit. We know that a big focus on it is, the, of you know, legacy, of course, for those who don't know, is a game where the choices you make permanently alter the game by destroying elements or putting stickers on elements or um, you know, various and sundry things. So there's this incredible sense of weight and purpose to every decision you make because you know, hey, once we do this thing, it will never change. It's not like, oh, we just you can't just hit the reset button and start all from scratch. And that creates so much weight and meaning and gravitas. I love it, love it, love it. So Aeon's in Legacy, I'm very excited about it. I guess a big focus is going to be on legacy elements of creating characters, because that's a big part of Aeon's in. Every time you play, you play as a different character with all kinds of different strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. This game, we build those characters up over time. And again, um, you know, as we build them and make these decisions, this becomes permanent. They, they will never change. And I've... I'm not going to continue raving about how awesome I think legacy games are. Uh, you either do or you don't at this point. This is the first deck builder one. Uh, it's tied into one of the best deck builders there is. It's absolutely amazing. I cannot wait. Aeon's in legacy must have. But as much as I must have this one, there's one game, my number one, that tops even that, and it is Rise of Queensdale. Why am I so excited about this? Well, one. It's a legacy game. Yes, folks. Last year, we've got Charterstone, which was the first legacy Euro. Um, because all the legacy games that have come out so far have really been kind of big adventuring style games, 4X games, war games, and adventure games. Charterstone was the first Euro, which was a game where all players are just working to build up a city. And depending on the permanent choices they make, the city becomes... Um, custom and unique to them. It was a brilliant, brilliant system, Jen. I loved it. It made my top 10 of the year. And now, this year, we're going to get the second Legacy Euro-style game. And I'm even more excited now because it's from Inca and Marcus Brand, the design duo behind, oh man, so many great, great games. Village, Turia, Raja of the Ganges, uh, the Exit the Game series, the, the brands are fast becoming one of the biggest powerhouse design duos in the industry. Everything they touch is just really, really well done. And now they're making a legacy game. It's a Euro-style game. I'm assuming the rise of Queensdale means it's another city-building game. So instead of building up Charterstone, we're building up Queensdale. And I can't wait to see what they do. It's weird. Um, even though it's going to come out in just a couple months, supposedly it's going to come out in German in March and in, in in English, the version will be available in August, I guess in time for Gen Con. So it's almost here, and yet we know almost nothing about it. But I don't need to know anything about it. I knew very little about Charterstone, um, other than the fact it was a legacy game, it was a Euro game, and it was from Jamie Stegmeier, who's a brilliant designer. That's all I know about Rise of Queensdale. It's a legacy game, it's a Euro-style game, and it's from a brilliant design duo, the brands. So yeah, it's my number one most anticipated game of the year for now. Of course, like I said, 
There's a lot of games that are going to be absolutely amazing we haven't even heard of yet. And that's why I will be updating this um, geek list throughout the remainder of the year. So, like I said, feel free to subscribe if you like. And um, also, check out the podcast. I'll be putting that up very shortly where I talk about um, pages 2, 3, 4, and 5 of this geek list. But that's it, folks. I'll end like I started and once again wish you a happy new year and say thank you very much for watching. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.